in a fast-paced, modern technology-driven industry, uh, some old school basic practices still apply. That is what our industry is based on. As agents, your sales representatives and brokers, um, you must uh, you earn your compensation for your expertise and your performance. Your advice to your clients must be carefully and knowledgeably administered. And we are being held to a higher and higher standard at all times especially now because the public knows they can scrutinize us or knows they can go to RICO if they're unhappy about something. So always, we'll give you some basics. We'll go through it with you. But always, if you have a question, reach out to one of your managers, reach out to me. We're always available for you here uh, to help you in any way we can. Um, the first thing um, that we'll talk about is deposits. First of all, incoming deposits must be certified. Um, we never deal in cash. I didn't put that in there, but I think we all know that. Here with means on the table with the offer. Um, there are times where a buyer's agent will send you a photo of a cha uh, check or a bank draft but that's not here with. It has to be on the table to be here with. Upon acceptance, um, unless otherwise stated in this agreement, means within 24 hours of acceptance. There's no exception for weekends, statutory holidays, it's Sunday. It means 24 hours. Uh, with electronic banking being available to most people, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, we also have the instructions for you to uh, have buyers do wire transfers into our account. All right. But understand with wire transfers, sometimes it can take us up to 24 hours to verify that the funds did hit our trust account. As otherwise stated in this agreement, uh, you must have a, a clause in Schedule A describing when the deposit will be delivered. Okay, so that's the different meanings for your deposits and what to look out for. Is it a deal without a deposit? It absolutely, yes, is a deal without a deposit. A deposit is just an element of your transaction. It is not consideration. Consideration is signing through seal. Um, so if you have an agreement in place and you do not get a deposit, you, it, that does not cancel the transaction. It doesn't terminate it. You must get a mutual release with lawyer's advice or a lawyer's written direction to resell the property. Um, you can be held liable if you give your client the wrong advice. So if the deposit doesn't show up, you get on the phone to your client, you say to them, we need to call your lawyer, I need a quick note, email, whatever, uh, as to his instructions on what you should do, whether you should sign a mutual release, or um, put it back on the market, or what are we doing, okay? The original buyer can always be held liable for a lower selling price and a forfeit of the deposit that he did not submit. So um, if the deposit did not, uh, sorry, the original buyer can be held liable for a lower selling price and forfeit of the deposit that did not appear if the seller does not release the buyer's liability on the original agreement. We want the brokerage released of liability and obligation to pay commission to the cooperating brokerage, but it's up to the lawyers whether their clients are going to be signing mutual releases. Okay. We've got a real life example. This one happened a couple of years ago. We had five multiple offers and it was multiple representation. So we had agents on our listing and our buyer's side. Um, our buyer, through one of our other agents who won the bid, did not deliver the deposit. 
this was a large vacant land deal down in Richmond Hill, I believe it was. Uh, we received the seller's lawyer's direction to resell the property. The, um, the seller's agent reached out to the second highest offer. The second highest offer was $800,000 uh, shortfall in price. There was a RICO case against our agents for unethical behavior by the original buyer, which failed because he was trying to get off the hook because he was now being sued for the $800,000 plus the $100,000 deposit that was never delivered. Um, this um, case went to court. The uh, seller won. He didn't win that whole 800,000, but he did get 100,000 plus 375,000 in damages. So be very careful when advising people to sign a mutual release if the deposit didn't show up. We want that through a lawyer, okay? This is probably one of the ones that we see the most issues with. Um, when we are reviewing offers, whether we're a buyer's agent or a seller's agent, we think we know what's in the clauses. For heaven's sakes, read every, every word of the documents. Uh, read and understand the confirmation of cooperation and representation, including the commission, the offer, and especially the schedule B, every word, no exceptions. This is so important. We have some very strange schedule B clauses coming to us from other brokerages. You need to read all the way through it. Some of the time you'll find two or three clauses are being smushed together and reading as one clause. So you have to be careful and understand what's in there. Okay. Review and understand ahead of time the clauses in the pre-printed OREA TREB forms that you use. If you're unsure about a clause, go to forms explained in TREB or go to your manager. And that is just um, the basic pre-printed clauses in the OREA forms. You should be able to explain those to a client, okay? So we're saying if you're not really comfortable with them, um, Go to the pre-printed forms, understand what's in there. And also you need to know what's in there so that if there are clauses coming in on a schedule A, those take precedence over what's already in the offer in the pre-printed clauses. So you don't want anything in there that is going to nullify what's in the pre-printed clauses, okay? Um, real life example. A uh, buyer agent assumed the clause said the seller would pay for the status certificate where the clause clearly called for the buyer to pay for it. The buyer's agent who prepared the offer ended up paying for it. Just That's just a very easy one that didn't cost anybody huge amounts of money. Um, another one was where the confirmation of cooperation and representation indicated the cooperating brokerage would be paid a commission of 2.5% rather than 2.25, as was offered on the listing. Everyone signed it without reading it. Um, a commission increase other than offered on the listing must be agreed to before the offer is presented. But there was an argument on this. Eventually, the cooperating brokerage was paid 2.5% because the listing agent did not read and correct the amount. All right, so those are a couple of really basic ones. Um, on a commercial transaction that we had, the HST on a commercial transaction is in addition to the purchase price and the pre-printed form clearly says so. The property sold for 530,000, but the schedule A of the offer had a clause inserted that the HST was included in the purchase price. That caused a contradiction. It also caused a huge fight between buyers, seller, lawyers, agents were being accused. So this is just a really nice synopsis without all of the fun language that went along with this. The lawyers argued, but closed the property. 
the seller ended up receiving $470,000 after paying $60,000 HST to CRA. Both agents and brokerages have been put on notice by the seller's lawyer that a lawsuit is being initiated. They actually, since I wrote this, they came to a settlement. The agents split the HST between them. So it was a substantial amount of money, but the lawsuit was going to proceed because obviously the agents didn't read the documents and didn't understand HST. Another one, uh, the agreement on the property, the agreement uh, was for $635,000 with a $10,000 deposit in multiple representation. The deposit wasn't received. A mutual release was received with the following errors. Um, so the first thing it said was that the deposit to be returned was going to be $635,000. It was going to be returned to Century 21 Heritage Group instead of to the uh, buyer or seller. There was no irrevocable date. There was no witness on the buyer and seller hand signatures. There were no dates on the buyer's and seller's signatures and no date or time on the confirmation of acceptance. Um, when we see do a document like that, I will not do anything with it. It will sit until the agents have to go back to their clients and get the form corrected and do it all properly. That usually involves, uh, number one, looking foolish to your clients, but number two, it's usually, um, it involves an argument with the other agent because they then have to go to their clients to correct it. And typically what we find is when something like this happens, it is um, both agents who didn't notice that the document was being done incorrectly. So um, again, I can only emphasize to you, read what is in front of you. Know your marketplace. This is one that can sneak up on you because you work really, really hard with your clients and then they start expanding their, their search areas and you end up going into places that you don't know as well as what you originally were working with them on. Um, but we are advising you not to work in unfamiliar types of real estate if you're not comfortable with commercial, with farms, with cottages, uh, or if you're unfamiliar with areas, a board where you don't, don't have access is usually a first good clue. Um, be very careful in trading in real estate in those areas. Refer out the uh, transaction to, or the client or ask an agent with expertise in that area to guide you. It'll cost you a referral fee, but that's often worth it uh, not to make um, some sort of an error that can be avoided. A um, couple of examples that we have. The first one, um, this happened a couple of years ago again, uh, an agent who was not familiar with the Orangeville area took clients and sold them a townhouse. Um, it turns out that the neighbors knew and the local media had extensively reported that the townhouse belonged to a nurse who had been murdered on the premises. The property had evidence of a struggle. The buyers were informed of this by the neighbors during a pre-closing visit. So the property had firmed up but not yet closed. And that's typically where clients find out about things with the home they're buying, it's from the neighbors. Neighbors love to inform the new buyer of what's going on in the area. Uh, the buyer agent did not ask and the listing agent had not disclosed the facts. The property did not close, but would have turned into a lawsuit had it closed. So that's an example. There's another one, I believe, up in Keswick where the property did close 
And it was a matter of, again, something that was very well known locally because the local news uh, papers were, were certainly reporting on it. And it was where, unfortunately, and really tragically, some child had died in an above ground pool and the par- property was sold without having disclosed that. Um, there was a huge lawsuit after the fact and the agents were found liable for not disclosing and not asking the questions. So you have to be aware of what's going on in the area. Another one that's a great example that I've been using for quite a few years because it's so blatant is that um, there is an, a street in Newmarket called William Dunn Crescent. You can Google it. You can Google elevated arsenic and topsoil. This used to be an apple orchard. And uh, farmers at that time used arsenic or arsenic-based bug killers, I guess, to spray the orchards so that when this property was built, um, what the builder developer did was they excavated all the soil where the homes were being built, but there was a lot of green space, which is the former orchard, um, all of that green space in behind the properties was uh, still the original orchards. And of course, um, even years later, if the soil was tested, they could find traces of arsenic. Um, would your The thing you have to think about there, and it's not a problem if it's disclosed, but would your buyers be happy if they found out after the fact? So when you're selling a property, it's always a good idea to start Googling the property address, Googling, um, or at least investigating through the town what's going on in the area. And if you're working and selling locally, um, these are things that you become aware of over time and you don't have to worry about it quite as much. But if you're going out of area, you need to be very, very careful about doing your due diligence and making sure there's nothing in there uh, where you're trading that, that, that can harm your clients or that you can be blamed for not having disclosed. So those are a couple of things about knowing your marketplace. Uh, Another thing that we see all the time, and this is such an easy one, is always disclose personal relationships. If you have a direct or an indirect financial interest in the property, or if you're related to somebody who is buying or selling and you don't have a financial interest, you must disclose And your disclosure must be presented prior to offer presentation or along with your offer. The way you do your disclosures is Form 160 as acquisition of property or 161 is disposition of property. Um, Places all over that to disclose what your relationship to the buyer is or if you are the buyer. Even if it's a landlord-tenant relationship, if you're either the tenant related to the tenant or you're the landlord or related to the landlord, these disclosures must be made. If you're unsure if the relationship is close enough to disclose it, it never hurts to disclose it. Just disclose. If you have to ask a question, disclose it. One of our examples was um, one of our agents is a half owner of a detached property with her daughter. The agent listed the non-retrofit basement apartment for rent in her daughter's name with no disclosure. The agent ended up terminating the listing because we do not um, endorse our agents uh, renting out non-retrofit apartments. The agent then leased the apartment privately with only the daughter as landlord on ARIA forms with no agency documents and no disclosure that this agent 
uh, was on title. The tenant complained to Rico, who is uh, about who the landlord was, the contents of the lease, and that the space was misrepresented. Rico treated this transaction as being under our brokerage. No matter what you do as a registrant, Rico looks at it that you have to take your professional duties even outside of the brokerage relationship when you are out there dealing in, in real estate. So it issued a warning to the agent and a requirement to register, pay for, and attend a RICO compliance workshop. Okay, so be careful with your disclosures. Our next little goodie is cash back to clients. Why we as realtors pay people to work with us, I have no idea. However, it is done. All commission agreements with clients must be in writing. Cashback offers to clients must be in writing and must be specific. The best place to note these arrangements and have them acknowledged is on the BRA or the listing agreement. However, any legible document source is acceptable. Further to that, our brokerage, in addition to any other place that you note your, your commission arrangement, our brokerage has a specific form to be completed and to avoid miscommunications. Uh, what the form does is it explains to the public how cashbacks are handled, that the brokerage takes in the commission because it's earned by the brokerage, we take our portion, then we're, as we're paying out the agent, if they direct us to um, give a portion of their commission back to the client, that, that is when we do it, okay? So it, it also shows your client the flow of cash through the brokerage that it isn't all your money, okay? Real life examples, our agent's buyers claim that our agent promised them a 1% cash back when they purchased. This was not documented, nor was it paid out because we had no knowledge of it. The agent reduced his listing commission from five to 4% on this buyer's listing. And he claimed that that was the 1% he um, promised them. The buyer canceled the listing because they said the agent was dishonest. Uh, the brokerage tried to negotiate to keep the listing with no success. A RICO complaint was filed and the agent responded that there was never a 1% cashback agreement. And the agent sent all of his trade records for the past seven years with us that showed he never gave a cashback to any buyer. Rico dismissed this file, but it all could have been avoided if it had been documented clearly as to what that 1% was. And what he was promising them was a um, listing commission reduction if they purchased through him. So that was our first uh, example. There was another one that there was a RICO complaint against our agent that he promised 1% cash back by text. But when the property closed, the agent reduced that arbitrarily to a quarter percent. The agent claimed that the original cash back of 1% was reduced to a quarter percent verbally because the amount of the work completed by the agent, there were several failed offers, many showings, et cetera. The sale price of the property was $1,650,000. So the difference was $12,000. Uh, that is a chunk of change. RICO found our agent in violation of the code. The registrant's best interests, conscientious and competent service, uh, reducing agreements to writing. None of that was adhered to. Um, so be very careful when you're making verbal agreements. And this is another reason that we always, always tell you to um, get your cashback agreements in writing with the client. And if there is a change, if somebody changes their mind, if you're adjusting the amount, make sure you do it in writing. 
Okay. The agent was fined, had to pay for and take a, a REBA 2002 legal course. These courses that um, RICO is um, requiring, some of them can be quite expensive. I know that some of these are around $750. When the agents had to take these in person, that was also a big deal because you were traveling downtown to RICO to take the courses, which is where they were being facilitated. Most of them now are online. However, um, you never know with RICO what they're going to require you to do to keep your registration intact. The next thing we wanted to talk about was rental chattels and fixtures. Um, this is a kind of a generic one, however, I will tell you that rental items are ending up more and more on our desks because they're becoming more, the rent to own contracts are becoming more common. Always as a listing and a buyer agent, clarify what is owned and what is rented. Please review the rental contracts before offer presentation because some of them can be quite long and involved. Uh, also, if you are the listing agent, note that it can take time to get a copy of a contract if the seller does not have it. Sometimes they can be very difficult to get. Um, be aware of whether a contract can be transferred to a new owner and at what cost. Clarify if the contract can be bought out and at what price and by whom. And the ones to really watch out for are solar panels. Furnaces and air conditioners are becoming far more common. Alarm systems, I'm sure you're aware of those. Uh, tankless hot water heaters are causing us he headaches at this point. So those are just things to be aware of. Appointments. And this has to do with acting as an agent and being professional. Appointment times must be strictly adhered to. No excuses. This is a constant problem right now. Uh, if you are late canceling or rescheduling an appointment, you must call the listing brokerage before your scheduled showing time. An appointment between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. means you arrive no earlier than 1 p.m. and you are out of the property by 2 p.m. So you have to schedule yourself accordingly. You must leave a business card, follow instructions, and leave the property secured. And I know that we as listing agents have real problems enforcing this from other agents. But if we act professionally and we keep an eye on things, that is as far as we can go. We can't educate the other side. However, we can complain about the other side. So um, do not give another agent waiting to show the property, the keys or the lockbox. They'll have the code to reopen the property. And if they are a professional agent, they will understand why you're not handing over a lockbox and keys. The property belongs to the sellers. You must oversee your clients when showing a property and make sure you and they and any children with them respect the property. Keep the buyers together and do not allow them to wander the property alone. You're responsible if anything goes wrong. Okay, you must have a copy of your RICO license in your possession while showing property, and you must show it when asked. This is especially so when showing condos. Uh, the RICO app on your phone um, has your registration in there, so you can just flip it on your phone. Otherwise, you have a paper copy, but RICO is... Um, sending out fewer and fewer paper copies. They want you using uh, the digital app, okay? Um, just a heads up, many properties have surveillance. Be careful. Advise your clients to be careful as well uh, about any comments during a showing. 
insulting comments about the property are being reported to RICO. And if your client makes that insulting com comment, that's one thing, RICO can't control that. However, if you agree with them or you um, say something out of line and it's caught on tape, um, RICO will, will, um, will absolutely fine you for unprofessional behavior. Uh, as well, you do not want the sellers to overhear any negotiating strategy or, or sensitive conversations. So be aware that there is an awful lot um, of filming going on now. Never, ever, ever give out a lockbox code or allow a client or building inspector to enter a property or even walk the grounds without you. And I'm emphasizing ever. RICO will um, terminate your license for that type of behavior. You can also, um, it's been known that the police have been called on clients walking a property without their agent. It's trespassing. Written offers. Excuse me. All agreements have to be in writing. Do not ever verbally negotiate an offer. Verbal offers are not legally binding. They do not exist. Do not negotiate an offer by email or text. Texts and emails are to be used as follow-up on the agreement only. Sign backs back and forth must include the entire document not just the one or two pages with the changes. You cannot go back to an executed document and make changes. Once the document is agreed to, um, any changes moving forward must be done by amendment. And this includes all contracts. This is basic contract law. This is the same as a listing agreement or a BRA, et cetera. Um, you know, you're going to extend the listing agreement verbally, it's agreed to, and you just change it on the agreement and hand it in. You can't do that. Um, you're going to change the price. You can't just change the price and get initials on an executed agreement. You have to do an amendment. Okay. Some real life examples. Uh, let's see. The cooperating agents tell you that he has a full price offer for your sellers. You tell your sellers it never materializes or it comes in low. Your sellers get angry, not with the other agent. They get angry with you. Do not deal in verbal offers. Your buyer tells you to prepare an offer for a certain amount. You call the listing agent to tell them you have an offer. He asks you how much and impulsive you, impulsively you tell him. Suddenly, the listing agent registers their own offer. It's usually better than yours. Um, or you meet your client for signatures and they tell you that their family says they're offering too much and insist you reduce the price. You then have to explain that to the listing agent or to clients. So be careful with discussions um, about price, about contents of offers, about negotiating any type of offer verbally. You take a listing, cancel and relist it. You have verbal instructions to do so from your client. So you adjust the dates on the original listing agreement. You can ask our admin staff at the front desk. Agents try to do this all the time. You can't do that. And our front desk staff is instructed never to accept something like that. Uh, RICO needs to investigate the offer presentation process in, in a multiple offer situation because a buyer who won the bid wants to make sure there was nothing irregular. Um, you, you produce uh, the front pages only of the original offers with an improved price. When you're doing something like that, it is a problem. You absolutely have to have your documents in line and you can't be doing things verbally. Okay, so those are just a few of the problems that we encounter over and over again. 
Another thing that we're finding is that um, sometimes you're, you're up against an agent who can take over the process and become a little bit bullying as to the way things are going to happen. It's up to you as a professional to control your offer process. Um, you must register and organize your offers with the front desk so the brokerage is aware at all times if and how many offers are current. No exceptions. We need to know. Uh, this is basic agency. Those offers belong to the brokerage. We have to be informed at all times. It's your responsibility to update the front desk if an offer comes directly to you without having been registered. We see this happen quite often. Please let the front desk know what's going on. It's your responsibility to inform the front desk as to the status of a property or offer at all times. An offer can come in, it's negotiated, the front desk needs to know if the property is sold conditionally, firm, or if it's back on the market. Do not ever indicate that there is an offer if there isn't one. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And in multiple offer situations, be aware of irrevocable times. Sometimes you get carried away if you have more than one offer and you fail to act within the irrevocable time. Please be careful about that. Always keep your client informed, give them their options and let them decide what to do. Even if they have previously told you what to do, people change their minds. And the perfect example of this is when we were seeing a lot of multiple offers and we, you would get, as a listing agent, you would get a call from buyer agents saying, how many rounds are you doing? Meaning how many times are you sending offers back? That's not your decision to make. That is something that when you are um, uh, reviewing and presenting offers, you're giving your, your uh, sellers the, um, the guidance as to what they can do, and then they have to make up their minds. It has to be their decision what happens with the offers, if you're sending them back, how many times you're sending them back, etc. I know they, they look to you for guidance, which you can give them, but you don't make the decision, they do. Um, let me see. If you are in multiple representation during multiple offers, um, have a colleague assist you by presenting the offers to your seller or by working with your buyer. You may have to compensate them, but it's a small price to pay to be able to show an arm le arm's length procedure. Uh, I believe Tressa, the new Real Estate and B Business Brokers Act, is going to have some new guidelines on this. So it's going to be inter interesting to see what happens here. Um, until now, we have been able to do multiple representation. We as a brokerage have always uh, guided our salespeople to make sure that you are perceived to be arm's length from that uh, relationship and it keeps you safer. Uh, understand that your manager may be available to, to help you during uh, multiple offers but it's only during normal business hours, after hours. Uh, you have to find someone you trust. You can call your manager and ask who you can involve in this. Um, but uh, please, please, if you're in multiple representation, be extremely careful about um, presenting on both sides. Surveys. When representing the seller, cross out any reference to a survey in the offer and give the cooperating agent what you have. This is when you are the listing agent, of course. Be prepared when listing the property. Be aware of what a survey, a copy of survey, current and up-to-date survey, survey showing boundaries, survey showing lot lines, survey showing all buildings and lot lines, and what's a copy of a plan of subdivision? 
normally these documents are named, be careful with it. Uh, I will say that most new agents have purchased at least one of these in their career, and they are no longer four or $500. They can be quite expensive if you have to call a surveyor out and um, have the property resurveyed. Um, oftentimes you can buy them online. However, if you have to involve a surveyor, it becomes very expensive. Witnessing signatures. You can only witness a signature if you physically present or see a wit or witness the person signing the document at that time. You cannot witness a signature after the fact, even if you recognize the signature. There's no going back and putting in a witness signature. You cannot witness a signature if your client printed and signed the document in another location, if you didn't physically see them signing. You cannot witness a DocuSign AuthentiSign signature. Verification is recorded, dated, and authenticated on the digital cert, uh, certificate. Um, a physical witnessing cannot be done on that. Do not let another agent force you to witness a signature you did not physically observe. Uh, for quite a while, there were a couple of brokerages that were insisting that all signatures be witnessed, even if they were digital. A husband and wife cannot witness each other's signatures. I'm not positive on this, but I don't think that a child, even if they are over the age of 18, can witness a parent, parental signature. So be careful with your witnessing when you're working on offers in person. Hand in the deal. Once you have an agreement in place, firm or conditional rental or sale of property, hand in the deal immediately. Um, especially lease agreements, uh, rentals, um, closing can come very quickly. And uh, we've had many instances on rentals where the lease is drawn up or the agreement to lease is drawn up just a day or two in advance of the property actually closing. Um, that can become problematic. Uh, it has consequences in agency, in brokerage liability, in trust accounts, and it is not good for your client's protection. Also, we can't guarantee payment of your commission if we were not able to uh, invoice the listing brokerage or the seller's lawyer in a timely manner, meaning before they disperse funds out of their trust account. Um, if the money, if we're not invoicing them on time and they do not disperse the funds correctly and those funds are gone, we cannot um, claim for commission if you didn't hand in your deal in time and we didn't invoice in time. So we are exploring penalties for handing in transactions late, uh, doing a pre-construction deal and then handing it in a year and a half later, it doesn't help any of us. And this happens all the time. The rentals are another one that we have a real problem with getting in on time. So be aware, basement apartments. Uh, auxiliary secondary dwelling units, agents are not to list these for rent or lease or facilitate a tenant entering into a rental or lease agreement in a unit that is not legal or municipally approved. This includes basement apartments, granny flats, rooming houses, etc. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Agents must perform their own due diligence to verify the legal status of a rental unit. Excuse me. Um, when listing a property for sale, agents cannot suggest the property will generate income based on an auxiliary secondary dwelling unit. 
unless it is a legal unit. Um, the only way to indicate there's an unregistered basement apartment is to show two kitchens. We are, we understand that sometimes you have to um, help your clients out by helping them rent out a unit that isn't registered. We're exploring some options to help you with these situations. Until we come up with a solution, um, we are going to caution you that um, renting, uh, putting a tenant into an illegal unit or uh, renting out an illegal unit for a client has huge implications in that if there were any sort of um, an accident, a fire, something like that, the liability on um, the landlord, um, the seller, the agents is huge, but more so than that, we feel very strongly that you would be horrified if something happened to someone that you put into a unit that was not legalized or that was not safe. BRAs, buyer rep agreements. Um, I just did a TREB arbitration on this. Our agent had um, a BRA and the other agent asked about it, asked the uh, buyer several times about it. And the buyer, of course, said they didn't sign one, but they had. Um, so understand that when you are working with buyers, a lot of the time they, even if you explain it to them two, three, four times, they don't understand it or they don't want to understand it and they'll go off and work with someone. So when you're asking buyers if they've ever signed one, be prepared if they say no. Uh, at that time, ask them if they've put in offers on properties. How many properties have they seen? Who did they see it with? If they say they've signed one in the past or have done previous offers, ask to see the documents. That is your job. Even if they don't want to show you, it's up to you to verify that whatever they did sign in the past is not an enforceable BRA. Um, the arbitration panels don't really uh, take a buyer's word uh, at face value because they truly believe that no matter how much explanation you give them, they're not either not understanding or they're not working in good faith. And it is up to the agent to make sure that you understand if there is a BRA in place with another brokerage or not. It's only good for one purchase or lease. If you've got a client who wishes to purchase or lease more than one property, you, or your original BRA does not cover it. You have to do a new BRA for each transaction. When you fill out the BRA, do so properly fill out how long the contract is for, the geographic location, which must be identifiable on a map and not just GTA or Ontario, <clears throat> how much commission you are to receive and or if you are giving a cash back. If your buyer purchases through another agent and you want to claim for commission, this must be done through your manager. Since TREB finds under procurement, you must be able to prove that you are actively working with the buyer and that the other agent interfered with your BRA, either willingly or negligently. So it isn't just a matter of signing up your client to a BRA. You have to show that you are actively working with them, that they understood what they signed and that the other agent who signed them to a BRA as well knew that they were working with someone else and they deliberately interfered with your BRA. So that's sort of what's on the line with BRAs. Agency and the brokerage. 
never let an outside uh, agent handle our brokerage documents, not even to fax a document. Um, never handle anything for an agent outside of our brokerage. This is private information. It's brokerage information. Um, agency is with the brokerage, and that is who must handle your client's documentation. You're responsible for doing your own due diligence to ensure your buyer is qualified for their financing. We're having all sorts of issues right now <clears throat> because of the market change um, where um, buyers may not be able to afford what they purchased if they're not getting the financing that they hope to get. At the time that they were pre-qualified, just saying to you that we've been pre-qualified is not good enough. You need to see some sort of documentation that they qualify for their purchases. Um, most, uh, let's see, well, how can we put this? Most agents who have been in this business for some time, who work on a professional basis, will not even take clients out to start looking for a property unless they have verification that that client is going to get financing. Okay. Uh, you can be held liable for mortgage fraud if you are aware or you help your client in using any creative income documentation. The brokerage will not come to your rescue in this and have the option to immediately terminate you for this. So we've had instances and we've had to do a couple of terminations where agents will take their client to um, a mortgage broker who isn't on the up and up. And there was the creation of some falsified income letters. As soon as we found out about it, which was very quickly, um, those agents are no longer with us. So be very aware that you cannot get creative with mortgage documents. FinTrack, we can't help it. This process and the forms are a government requirement. We all hate them. We know that. The forms must be, however, filled out properly. But what we have done is we've printed uh, guidelines and we've taken the forms and we've done some examples in red on, and blue on how to fill out these documents. So if you need that, go to your front desk. We have them for you and take a look at them. You must fill out the explanations and not just check mark the boxes. Our administrators spend in excess of 68 hours a week explaining to agents how to fill out the forms. Our um, deal administrators are, are, they're becoming very frustrated because it is the same questions over and over again. We have the information for you at the front desks with the examples on how to fill out the forms. Please don't make our administrators talk to you about it again. If you have questions or are unsure on how to proceed, please contact our FinTrack officer for the brokerage. And that is Peter Holgate out of the Hamilton office. He'll be happy to answer your questions for you. Um, However, good news, and that is that we are exploring a solution to the requirement for these forms, and it has to do with an app for your phone, but we are uh, absolutely uh, checking into this app very, very uh, carefully to make sure it's going to do exactly what it need, needs to do for both yourselves as um, agents as well as for our uh, FinTrack requirements for the brokerage. So we are working on that for you. Cover your vacation time. This one's a basic and, and never fails. We have an agent go away, leave the country, whatever, and everything that seemed to have been tied up all of a sudden comes to some sort of, a, um, I guess, um, 
either a disagreement or, or there's an issue and we do not have any idea of what happened, how to contact clients, how to contact the agent, and that's unacceptable. You must have someone cover your vacation time. It's your responsibility. You're an independent contractor and this is your business. If it costs you a fee to have someone cover, uh, that's an added cost of your vacation. But it is also what allows you to take the time off. You have to start treating this business professionally. If you have any open transactions, the covering agent must be able to access the files. If you have no open trades, the covering agent must know how to reach you for unexpected situations. You must let your front desk know who uh, know that you will be away and who's covering for you and if there is any way to reach you. Um, we're asking you that to make our lives easier, but also to help you in your business because there's nothing worse than an irate client that can't reach their agent, okay? Licensing and registration. Another good one that ends up on our desk. Uh, as a courtesy, we send you reminders of licensing responsibilities. It's your responsibility to pay for and complete your renewal courses on time. It's your responsibility to be aware of the deadlines and pay your dues and fees on time. It's your responsibility to keep your license and your ability to trade current. RICO registra registration requirements are changing this year, and we will need to do more frequent update courses. I know, it's not my fault. I'm sorry. Do not leave this to the last minute. Updating your course over holidays or on a weekend can be problematic. If you run into any issues with the RICO website updating, uh, on a weekend, it may not update until the Monday morning and you have a problem, they will terminate you. So then you, we have to get you reinstated, it costs you more money, et cetera. So be careful about that. I'm not gonna go into advertising, we're almost done. Just be aware of advertising standards and that all of your advertising uh, must meet recall requirements, not just your printed or your social media. Uh, so be aware of that. If you have any questions, give me a call, call your manager. Read your emails. This one is huge. This is your business and your responsibility. We communicate by email, so there is a lot of information transmitted to you. I understand we're all inundated with emails that doesn't relieve you of your responsibility to know what is going on in your business. You cannot opt out of brokerage communications. It's our job to keep you informed and it's your job to read the emails, all of them. Um, there is important information in the emails, including appointment information, brokerage memos, training schedules, licensing dead, deadlines, uh, brokerage, broker of record, and industry updates. So please keep an eye on those emails. And last but not least, attend office meetings and town hall. More and more, we are trying to put our information into our one-on-one -on -one communications with you in meetings or in town halls by Zoom or in person, uh, because we are finding that people are neglecting to read emails. Um, so we're, we're trying to cover off our information in our meetings. Um, you have the opportunity to ask questions and to clarify in that kind of a format. And I will just finish up this whole one hour long rant of what we have on our desks at any given time as managers. Uh, it's just to tell you that if you don't know, that's really and truly unacceptable. You have to stay on top of it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like our video, please hit the like button, the subscribe, and even the little bell to get notifications, just so you can stay in touch and watch more of these great videos.